We find our heroes in the Heart Home City Pokemon Center. It has been just a few hours since the end of the tag battle competition, and Barry is still fuming that Ash and Paul made it all the way to the finals when their teamwork was so terrible. Ash is in poor spirits too, but it has nothing to do with the tournament. Paul's parting words still ring in his ears, and he grits his teeth, muttering that next time they meet, he'll show Paul who's not worth the effort. But his mutterings are cut short when Caitlin approaches the boys and scolds Barry for being so loud and obnoxious. She then adds that if he's going to fill the center with noise anyway, it might as well be pleasant noise, and so drops one of her soothe bells into his hand with a soft tinkling sound. Barry asks what she's doing that for, and Caitlin says she doesn't need a second one, so this will be her way of thanking him for the interesting battle. Barry shoots a thumbs up, but she has already looked away from him, instead fixing her gaze on Ash. It doesn't take psychic powers to see that he is upset, so Caitlin beckons him over and asks him to help her collect the Pokemon from Nurse Joy so they can get back on the road. Ash asks if they even know where the next battle facility is, with Barry sighing that they don't. Caitlin looks as if she has something to add, but then Barry perks up, saying he does know someone who would know. With a manic grin, he then rushes off to a row of video phones, while Ash and Caitlin exchange a confused look, then follow after him. When they arrive, Barry is already on a call, and to Ash's surprise, the person on the other end is Palmer. Ash exclaims that of course the strongest frontier brain of the region would know where the other ones are, with Barry nodding that this was his thought exactly. When they come into view, Palmer greets Ash and Caitlin by name, asking how their journeys are going, and saying he hopes that Barry isn't too much of a handful. Barry howls that's totally unfair, and that he's decided his next battle will be against his dad to teach him some manners. But Palmer says though he eagerly awaits the day when he can face Barry at the top of his battle tower, there is a procedure that must be followed about when challengers can face him. He then asks how many prints the boys have, with Ash and Barry showing off the two they have. Checking them out, Palmer says that this means they'll be facing Dahlia next, since they can only gain access to the 4th and 5th facilities once they've beaten the Minor 3. Barry and Ash look at each other, remembering how challenging their battles against Thornton and Argenta were, and ask if this means the 4th and 5th are that much stronger than the others. Palmer chuckles that as the 5th he doesn't want to brag, but that Scott must think there's some degree of power gap, since he's the one who put that rule in place. This excites the boys, who say that hearing about the 4th and 5th have them all fired up, so they can't wait to challenge them. Palmer tells them not to get ahead of themselves, since once they beat the Minor 3, they'll be entering a whole other league of battling. To make sure he gets his point across to the eager youths, Palmer says that he's battled many trainers over the years, but three in particular have stood out to him as being true masters of battling. Pyramid King Brandon, Champion Cynthia, and... For the briefest, almost imperceptible moment he pauses, then finishes, and the fourth frontier brain. With a wry grin, he adds that there isn't much he wouldn't give to be able to watch when the boys finally face the fourth, but then forces himself to return to a neutral expression, saying that first they have to get through Dahlia, and she's no pushover. Barry says he vaguely remembers meeting her when he was younger, with Caitlin smirking that she bets they got on famously, since they're both loud, obnoxious, and insanely competitive. Barry glares at Caitlin, but Palmer decides to be the adult here and head things off. He tells them that her battle arcade can be found in Veilstone City, where the old game corner used to be. Barry thanks his dad, and promptly hangs up before Palmer can even finish saying goodbye. Ash says that maybe he should call his own dad, since he hasn't spoken to him in days, but Barry snaps that there's no time, since he wants to get to Veilstone as soon as possible. Ash admits that he's eager to challenge Dahlia too, and so even though night is falling, the trio decide to head out of the city and onto Route 209. However, this journey proves to be a rather short one, since before they are even 10 feet onto the route, they spot a familiar but highly unwelcome face, that of Derek. When he sees them too, he rises from his small, neatly arranged camp and yells at them to stay right where they are. Then, before allowing any time for a response, he lobs a Pokeball, from which bursts a Houndoom, who he orders to use Roar. Derek's Houndoom lets out a fierce roar, which makes the group cover their ears, but for some reason, Caitlin seems more affected than the others, falling to her knees and gritting her teeth. Furiously, Ash demands to know what Derek did to her, and Derek coldly states that he has trained his Houndoom so that its roar could impede even her psychic abilities. He then tells Caitlin, who he addresses formally as My Lady, that she won't be escaping him this time, so it would be wise to just give up this game and come along with him willingly. Barry sneers there's no way he's ever letting a creep with stupid two-tone hair take his friend anywhere, and so brings out Prinplop. He then orders a water gun, a 
Derek is faster once again, speedily withdrawing Houndoom before the super effective attack can hit and swapping it out for an Empoleon. Mercifully, this brings Houndoom's roar to an end, and so Ash checks on Caitlyn, but to his dismay, she reveals that it'll take her a while to recover enough to teleport away again. Their conversation is then cut short by Primplup flying past them and slamming backwards into a tree with enough force to fell it. Barry panically runs over to check on his starter, while Derek coldly states that Barry's battle style is juvenile, uninspired, and sloppy, so he has no chance to win here. Rising to his feet, Ash challenges Derek to see how he likes his battle style, bringing forth Meltan and calling for a Thundershock. Derek doesn't even bother to withdraw Empoleon this time, tanking the hit, then scolding that Thundershock is such a basic electric move that Ash should at least have the decency to upgrade it to Thunderbolt if he has any pride in his work as a Pokemon trainer. He then has Empoleon knock Meltan out with a single Brick Break, which smears the gelatinous Pokemon like butter across the dirt, demonstrating the same ruthless efficiency he did against Barry. Only when both boys have tried and failed to halt his attack does Derek allow any real emotion to enter his voice, and that emotion is furious disgust. Seething, Derek pronounces that Ash and Barry are unworthy, and that they will now leave him and Caitlyn, or he will make them leave, with none of the restraint he has been showing so far. However, Ash and Barry have other ideas, having risen from their defeats with more determined expressions. With matching glints in their eyes, they tell the older man that they don't leave friends behind, so he can do his worst. This makes the edges of Derek's pursed lips spasm slightly as he looks from Ash to Barry and then finally to Caitlin. He then mutters the words passion and perseverance as though they hold some deeper significance before resetting his gaze on the two boys and sinisterly telling them that if this is what they choose then he will make them abundantly familiar with the consequences of that choice. From behind Ash and Barry, a confident female voice declares that that too is a choice, and she hopes he's ready to face the consequences of that. Turning around, they see Argenta, with Caitlin's arm slung over one shoulder. With the same fury as the boys, she tells Derek that it is clear Caitlin doesn't want to go with him, so if he persists in harassing her, she will join forces with these children to oppose him. Derek raises an eyebrow, and though the rest of his face remains impassive, there is concern in that tiny motion. After a moment to consider his words, Derek speaks, and it is in his usual measured tone. Looking from Argenta to the boys, and then finally letting his gaze linger on Caitlin, he says, Don't trouble yourself. I have seen all I need to, and so can withdraw in peace. Farewell. And without another word, he is gone, vanishing into the night on the wings of a star raptor. When Derek is finally out of sight, Ash and Barry attend to Caitlyn and thank Argenta for her support, admitting that they don't know if they could have defeated Derek on their own. Argenta beams that she was happy to help, but warns them that they had best redouble their training, since a battle with Derek is inevitable as he oversees the battle castle. In unison, Ash and Barry look at each other and exclaim that he must be the fourth frontier brain Palmer warned them about. Caitlin nods that Derek is indeed a powerful battler while clutching her head with her free hand and grumbling about the use of Houndoom's roar. Barry teases that if Caitlin's already complaining then she must be good as new, earning him a glare from the girl. Laughing, Argenta tells her that she has to agree with Barry and so she'll be taking her leave now, wishing the kids luck and telling Caitlin to play nice with Dahlia. Caitlin's response is an unenthused look that suggests she'd rather eat broken glass. As a result of Caitlin still feeling unsteady, the group's pace remains slowed for several days. But this extra time is not wasted, with Ash and Barry both putting in long hours at night to improve alongside their starters. Ash and Meltan work on upgrading the Steel-type's Thundershock to Thunderbolt, but despite their best efforts, they can only increase the power output by a fractional amount, far from what they would need to call this attack a true Thunderbolt. Meanwhile, Prinplop's pride has been wounded by the humiliating defeat it suffered at the hands of Derek's Empoleon, and so under Barry's supervision, it has taken to sparring with Chatter at every chance it can get. And so, it is a tired but stronger trio who arrive at Salacian Town, and in spite of his eagerness, Barry suggests that they stop for the day and allow their Pokemon to rest and recover. The others agree, and since they're going to have some time off, Ash tells his friends that he's going to check out the Salacian Ruins, since he and his dad plan to visit there after the exhibition match with Palmer. 
He then invites them to come along, but Barry declines because he wants Nurse Joy to check out his Pokemon, while Caitlin more bluntly says that it sounds really boring, so she'd rather take a nap. As shakes his head, saying they're missing out on some really interesting history, but that's their choice, and so he leaves them in peace, promising to meet up again for dinner. When Ash makes his way to the Salacian ruins, he is surprised to see that he is not alone. Standing in the raised courtyard are a man and a boy, locked in a fierce debate. Approaching them, Ash asks what's the matter, and the pair round on him, with the man saying that he and his young rival are engaged in healthy academic debate about what the treasure at the heart of these ruins really is. Ash is intrigued by this, and so the man continues that he believes the treasure to be a metaphor for the joy of adventure that one feels after spending a day exploring. Ash thinks this sounds feasible, but the other boy clearly doesn't, cutting in and boisterously declaring the treasure ain't feelings, it's stuff. So he bets it'll be a huge gold statue, probably of something important like Dialgo or Palkia. Ash has to agree that the boy has a point as well, so without any clear side to come down on, he just adds that he hopes he gets to see whatever the treasure is. This makes the man laugh and thump Ash on the back, saying that he loves this display of youth, and offers for Ash to join them on their little treasure hunt. Ash happily accepts, and so the man beams that his name is Peony, while his friend's name is Buck. Ash introduces himself in turn, and so the new trio of treasure hunters enter the ancient building, and begin making their way down a sloping tunnel into the bowels of the ruins. As soon as they are out of the light, Ash calls out Chimchar, who is happy to use its tail flame as a torch. Buck comments that his brother used to have a Chimchar like that when he was younger, though now it's a powerful Infernape. He then brags that Ash has probably seen it on TV, kicking Major Butt, adding that his brother is Flint of the Elite Four. Ash admits that he's seen Flint, but never met him, though he's heard champion Cynthia praise the man when talking with his father. Buck makes a disbelieving noise, but Ash persists, explaining in a more humble way that his father is Pyramid King Brandon. Buck scoffs that he can't be as important as his big bro, since he's never heard of him, but the mention of Brandon perks Peony right up. With a laugh, he exclaims that he should have guessed he was his old mate Brandon Sprog, since who else would dress in utilitarian green and orange khakis? Ash asks if Peony knows his father, and Peony proudly states that he and Brandon go way back, having battled plenty of times when he was still the champion of Gala. He then asks if Brandon is still hunting the Reggies, to which Ash proudly states that he's actually managed to capture all three. Peony chuckles a little at the word, three, but says that he'd love to catch up with Brandon again, since last time they talked they were young spry lads, and now they're crusty old dads. Ash says that when they get back to the Pokemon Center, he can call Brandon and they can chat, which the older man appreciates, but is soon cut off when Buck yells at them both to look as he points at something at the edge of the firelight. Floating a bit down the corridor is what appears to be a big letter X with an eyeball in the center. Ash and Peony both gush that this must be an unknown, having heard about them before, but Buck chuckles that he bets it's the treasure, since X marks the spot. However, all this noise startles the unknown, who promptly attempts to flee by opening up a portal in the corridor wall, but Buck has no intention of letting it get away, and so brings out a clay doll, ordering it to use Psybeam. The attack hits, blasting Unknown away from the portal, but when Unknown turns to face them again, there is a strange, glazed look to its eye. What's worse, the stones making up the floor, walls, and ceiling of the corridor have suddenly started to ripple and shift, with Peony groaning that Buck has gone and confused a Pokemon capable of warping reality. Buck evidently feels guilty about this mistake, but stifles this with more bravado, and so just declares that he'll catch the unknown, and that'll stop all this weird stuff. But that is easier said than done, since when he throws a Pokeball, the confused unknown catches it with psychic powers, and then seemingly disintegrates it with ease. It then fixes the trio with a gaze, one that is filled with nothing but rage. From behind them, the trio hear the sound of smashing rocks, and look around to see Unknown twisting and compacting the corridor in its rage and confusion. Ash yells at the others to make a run for it, so they don't get crushed, but they don't need to be told twice, joining him in running past Unknown and away from certain death. However, Unknown isn't done airing its grievance, and so gives chase, with the speed of the collapsing corridor getting faster as it seemingly gets more frustrated. Running at full pelt, our trio soon see that the path branches off in three directions. Being the adult of the group, Peony volunteers to take the center path and draw Unknown away from the boys while they take the left and right routes. 
Ash protests, but Peony tells him to let him do this, before jokingly adding that this way, when they talk to Brandon later, he can tell him that he owes him one for saving his kid. Ash smiles a little and nods, taking the left path like Peony indicated. Unfortunately, there is one little flaw with this plan. Chimchar. Its tail flame is still acting like a beacon, and so like a very confused moth to a flame, Unknown follows it and Ash down the left path, while sealing the three rats behind it as it approaches. Thankfully, having been raised by a man as pragmatic as Brandon, Ash has enough wherewithal not to panic here, and so instead withdraws Chimchar and dives down another side passage, hoping Unknown loses sight of him. Thankfully, here Unknown's confusion works in his favour, with it being too discombobulated to consider that it might have been tricked, and so presses on ahead down the main corridor. As it passes, Unknown warps the opening of Ash's new passage to contort into a dead end, but that is the extent of the damage, and when this corridor stays stable, Ash sighs in relief, before pressing forward in the hope of reuniting with Buck and Peony. Meanwhile, back in Salacion Town, Barry's Pokemon have been restored to full health, at least physically. Prinplup has become even more moody, refusing Barry's offer of lunch in favour of more training, and though Barry can respect this go-getter attitude, he is concerned that this might be the hastiness Argenta warned him about, and that Prinplup's current unhappy state is his fault. So, trying to channel his father, he instead suggests that they take a little break, maybe go get some ice cream, reminding it how as a Pierplup it would try to steal whole scoops off his cone, However, Prinplop is unmoved by this reminiscing, and so Barry's worry only deepens. Bending down, he tells his starter that he can see that it's hurting in more ways than just the physical, and will do anything to help, but first he needs to know what it needs. A girl's voice then pipes up that by the look of it, what it needs is a good fight. Looking up, Barry sees that the speaker is a girl with tan skin and blonde hair that is dyed pink at the ends. She then introduces herself as Peonia, and reiterates that Prinplop looks like it's itching for a battle. Barry grins that she's probably right, though his rival's off digging in some ruins right now, so it'll need to wait until tonight. He then curses that he hates waiting, to which Peonia laughs that so does she, so why doesn't he just battle her? Barry smiles that he likes the way she thinks, and so follows her to the back of the Pokemon Center, where a battlefield is waiting for them. Barry, as expected, tells Prinplup to get ready, while Peonia reveals a Tyrant, which she orders to take the offensive with Crunch. Prinplup runs in to meet it with a Metal Claw, but Barry tells it to hold off so they can get a better idea of Tyrant's capabilities. This split second of indecision is just what Tyrant needs, and it snaps its jaw around Prinplup's dominant wing, making the water type shriek in pain. When the two Pokemon then break apart, Prinplup's wing hangs limply by its side, and Barry can tell that it will be out of commission for the rest of the fight. However, neither he nor Prinplup have any intention of quitting, and so Barry tells Prinplup to use Water Gun to keep Tyrant at a distance. Prinplop obeys, and this does strike true, but Peonia tells her partner not to let a little drizzle stand in their way. So, after a moment to rally its spirits, the little dinosaur ducks its head and dashes through the deluge, smacking into Prinplop and sending it skidding back. Now forced into close quarters combat, Barry has Prinplop use Metal Claw with its offhand, and while this does hit, the move is clumsy, and the super effective nature of the damage is somewhat mitigated. Peonia chuckles that if Barry and Primplop want to bear their claws, then two can play at that game, before calling for a Dragon Claw from her Tyrant. The claws on Tyrant's hands then begin to glow green, and in a swift motion, it slashes both across Primplop's chest, bringing the penguin to its knees. Helpless, it looks back at Barry for guidance, but before Barry can give an order, Tyrant's jaws snap shut on either side of Primplop's face, knocking the water starter out, and ending the battle. Sighing that he's sorry, Barry recalls Prinplop and thanks Peonia for the battle. Peonia grins that it was no problem, since she loves getting into scraps with strong trainers, and though Barry lost, he's not half bad, so they should do this again sometime. Barry responds with a wan smile, but approaches his new friend, and shakes her hand to show appreciation for the battle. Back in the Salacian ruins, Ash has been walking down this one passage for what feels like eternity without any sign of Buck or Peony. Afraid that it might draw the attention of that enraged unknown, he hasn't called for them or brought Chimchar back out as a source of light, which has hobbled his pace somewhat, as he's been forced to feel his way more than see. However, after all this time alone, things have started to get a bit lonely, and so he brings out Meltan. 
As the small steel type bursts into view and climbs onto its trainer's shoulder, Ash smiles fondly and asks if it remembers the day they met, reminiscing that it was in some ruins not too different from the ones they're in now. Meltan warbles its agreement, and Ash laughs that it gave him such a fright when it dropped off the ceiling and fell onto his face. Meltan replies with a reproachful noise, and the boy abashedly rubs the back of his head, apologising for trying to wipe its body away with a tissue. Though, in his defence, he didn't know it was alive, let alone a Pokemon at the time. However, Ash is quick to tease that Meltan isn't wholly innocent in that encounter either, since after scaring him half to death, he did use that distraction to eat his flashlight, which he had sorely needed, before having the gall to fall asleep. Meltan makes a tinny whistling sound that Ash has learned to interpret as the Pokemon laughing, and so laughs with it, feeling the little steel type stretching out on his shoulder, just as it had during their first encounter. Ash then fondly asks if his partner is tired, offering to stop for a quick break and a snack. Meltan warbles its agreement, and so Ash takes a seat on the stony floor, pulling a pouch off his belt and pouring a handful of metal filings into his palm. At once, Meltan slithers down its trainer's arm and starts gorging itself on the filings, letting out delighted sparks of electricity as it does. One of these sparks is large enough that for a moment Ash sees they're sitting directly underneath a massive stone slab with something written on it. He then asks Meltan to do that again so he can read it, and his starter is happy to comply, lighting up the tunnel and revealing that the message on the slab is, when every life meets another life, something will be born. Looking down at his starter, with the memory of their first encounter so fresh in his mind, Ash can't help but agree with those words. And from the way Meltan is looking back at him, Ash can tell that in that moment their thoughts are one and the same. In unison, the partners beam at each other until the slab begins to warp and draw their attention back to it. With a gulp, Ash sees the X-shaped unknown who was chasing them earlier phase through the wall and glower down at him and Meltan with an expression that makes it abundantly clear that time has not lessened its fury. Then, to Ash's surprise, it manifests the Pokeball that Buck threw at it earlier and begins to spin it around in the air. Faster and faster the ball spins, and each time it seems to be growing larger. At first, Ash assumes this is an optical illusion, but soon realises that it actually is getting bigger thanks to Unknown's reality warping powers and steadily filling up more and more of the corridor. The young trainer doesn't know what Unknown's intentions are with that ball, but he's smart enough to know that whatever they are, they aren't friendly. And so, Ash scrambles to his feet, placing Meltan on his shoulder again so that it can light the way, and takes off down the tunnel. Moments later, a crashing noise that sounds like rumbling thunder echoes behind them, and when Ash looks back for an instant, he sees the boulder-sized Pokeball rolling after them, picking up speed as it goes. Frantically, he looks around for any side passages they can dive down like last time, but this time it seems they're out of luck, as their current corridor is a straight path sloping downwards. For a moment, he considers calling out Gabite, but is unsure if the dragon would have the strength to stop the incoming orb, and can only imagine how injured it would be if it could not. So instead, he decides to just keep running, and thankfully out of the darkness, a stone door looms into view. Reinvigorated by the prospect of not being crushed to death, Ash redoubles his speed and reaches the door, but when he tries to pull it open, it won't budge. Meltan hops down and tries to help as well, but even together they cannot move the stone even an inch. Desperation floods Ash as he hears the sound of the Pokeball boulder approaching, but as he looks down at his starter, he realises that though they're out of time, there is at least a way out for Meltan. He therefore orders it to slip through the crack underneath the door and save itself. Meltan furiously refuses, but Ash tells that this is the only practical solution, and that it has been an honour to journey with it. With a long, mournful screech, Meltan wraps its arms around Ash's ankles, then slips under the door and out of sight. Planting his back against the door, Ash turns to face the giant rolling orb as it comes barreling towards him and grits his teeth, ready to face his fate head on. As Ash faces what will surely be his untimely demise, he thinks sadly of Chimchar and Gabite, wishing he could have had them escape with Meltan, but at least they are safe in their Pokeballs. The thought which strikes him as rather ironic, considering how dangerous a Pokeball is to him at the moment. The ball is closing in on him now, so much so that he can see it even without Meltan's light, and has picked up enough speed that the red top and white bottom have blurred into a single haze of pink, which Ash regretfully realises will probably be the last thing he ever sees. And then, just as it is about to crush our hero flatter than a stunfisk, the door swings open behind him and he falls backwards, landing on his butt.
The giant Pokeball then crashes into the doorway, just where he had been standing seconds ago, with such force that it rattles the walls and causes the dust to fall from the ceiling, coating Ash's cap and clothes. Looking around for an explanation of his miraculous survival, Ash sees Meltan hanging from an ancient looking lever and runs over to hug it and thank it for saving him. The silvery Pokemon in turn squeaks its delight and leaps into his arms, happy to be reunited with its best friend. The reunion is a joyous one, but a brief one, with Ash soon remembering where they are and telling Meltan that they should look for a new way out, since the way they came in has been sealed off. Meltan nods, so begins slithering around the room they have found themselves in, while Ash carefully feels his way around the walls, hoping for another door. A little way into their search, Meltan chirps to get Ash's attention and uses Thundershock to light up what it has found, an ancient ladder, but just beneath it is an ornate stone plinth. Ash comes over to check it out, and to his surprise, sees that resting on the plinth is some sort of wooden pokeball. As soon as he picks it up, the clasp at the front flips up, and out of the ball bursts a Pokemon Ash has never seen before. It is small, quadrupedal, and mostly white with yellow eyes and red accents to its fur. When it sees Ash and Meltan, it giggles once, then vanishes, reappearing in a puff of smoke several rungs up the ladder, before vanishing again and appearing even higher up. Presuming that the Pokemon wants him to follow it, Ash clambers onto the ladder, with Meltan resting on his cap, and begins to follow the unfamiliar Pokemon as it keeps appearing and reappearing up the ladder. Finally, when they reach the top, which appears to be connected to the ceiling, Ash sighs, but the little Pokemon smirks, then presses its nose against one of the ceiling tiles, revealing that it is actually a trapdoor, before vanishing once more, and presumably heading up through the trapdoor. Ash follows suit, throwing it open, and as a result is blinded as daylight burns his eyes. Almost letting go of the ladder in shock and pain, Ash feels himself being lifted under the arms by a pair of strong hands, and as his eyes adjust, he sees Peony, while beside him Buck is looking not at him, but at the strange white and red Pokemon. In the light of day, Ash is struck by how similar it is to a Zoroa, and Buck even comments on this, adding that he plans to catch it since maybe it's the treasure of these ruins. Ash says that probably is the case, considering how deep down it was, but he is afraid Buck can't catch it, since he found it in a Pokeball. He then shows the other two the ancient looking ball, which makes Buck glower, while Peony lets out a low impressed whistle, urging the young man to show this beauty to his father. Ash says he'd like to, but he's not sure if the Pokemon who lives in it will be happy with him taking its home. He then takes a knee, and asks the mystery Pokemon if it would like to come with him and see the world after so long locked up in these ruins. The Pokemon considers this for a moment, giving him a haughty sniff and an upturned nose, but quickly ruins the effect by smirking. It then vanishes once more in a puff of smoke, and for a moment Ash thinks that it has rejected his offer, before it pops back into existence on his shoulder, chuckling all the while. Ash takes this to mean yes, and so flicks open the latch on the old wooden ball, returning the white and red Pokemon to it. It is night time when Ash, Buck, and Peony return to the Pokemon Center, and Ash is starving. Thankfully, his friends are already in the cafeteria, and with them is a girl around their age who Ash doesn't know. However, she seems to know someone in the group, based on her shocked expression when the three Ruin Explorers sit down at their table. It then becomes clear who, when the girl, who Barry tells Ash is called Peonia, addresses Peony as Dad. However, in the same breath, she also accuses him of trying to elbow his way into her life. As Peony tries to explain that this meeting is just coincidence, Ash tells Barry and Caitlin about his day in the ruins, with Barry doing likewise about his meeting with Peonia, and Caitlin rather proudly telling them both that she had an 8 hour nap, which almost topped her previous record. Barry rolls his eyes at this, and instead asks if he can see Ash's new mystery Pokemon, as well as whether he intends to use it in the Battle Arcade. At the mention of the Battle Arcade, Buck chokes on his drink, and demands to know how either of them know what it is, since it's meant to be a place only for super elite trainers like him, the brother of an elite four member. Ash says nothing, having deduced by now that Buck will take any chance he can to boast about that, but Barry is happy to engage in a battle of pride, and so brags that both him and Ash are the sons of their respective region's strongest frontier brains, both of whom are on par with champions, so in comparison, brother of an elite four member just isn't that impressive. This enrages Buck, whose face goes as red as his hair, and so the two loudmouths begin a verbal duel. Knowing this won't end anytime soon, the rest of their group finish their meals as hastily as they can and slink away. Ash decides to use this time to call his father like Peony suggested, and so makes his way over to the phone bank. 
When Brandon picks up, Ash can see that one of his shoulders is entirely encased in ice. But when asked, the Pyramid King just shrugs it off as a little training mishap with Reg Ice, expressing far more interest in how Ash's journey is going. Ash gives his father a rundown of his Sinnoh adventures thus far, showing off his factory and hall prints as he does. When he recounts how he and Barry stood up against Derek to protect Caitlin, Brandon tells his son how proud he is of him, saying that it seems like even in the short time since he set out on his journey, he's already grown so much, not just in strength, but as a man. Ash blushes a bit at this praise, and so turns the conversation back to his story, skimming over the journey to Salacian, before going into detail once more when he gets to the ruins. This excites Brandon, and the pair briefly geek out about all that Ash saw there, but eventually get back on track, with Ash telling Brandon about his fateful encounter with Peony and Buck. Brandon confirms that in his youth Peony was his friend and rival, much like how Ash and Barry are now, to which a voice behind Ash loudly declares that he never thought he'd hear the day when Brandon actually called him a friend. Peony then sidles up to Ash's side, and gives the Pyramid King a playful wave. Brandon responds with a gruff nod, though there is the ghost of a smile on his lips. Excitedly, Peony asks if Ash has shown Brandon the Pokeball yet, and the boy shakes his head, saying he hadn't even gotten to that part of the story yet. But his father's interest has clearly been piqued, so Ash chooses to omit his run-in with death, and instead pulls out the ancient-looking ball, spinning it around so Brandon can get a 3D view of it. The Pyramid King examines the ball and says that as he suspected, it is an archaic form of apricorn ball, probably dating back to when Sinnoh was still called the Hisui region. He then walks out of sight for a moment, and returns with an illustrated book, which he opens to show a diagram of the apricorn ball. Ash studies the image, finding it interesting as he compares it to the ball in his hand, but says that what he would actually like to pick his father's brains on is whether he knows what kind of Pokemon this is. He then opens the latch, and from it bursts the white and red Pokemon, who gives Ash an indignant little sniff for having been kept waiting so long. Ash is perplexed why this would offend it, when it presumably spent centuries in its ball before today, but he is given little time to mull, as Brandon's sharp intake of breath draws his attention. With deep solemnity, Brandon says he knows exactly what that is, rifling through the pages of the same book before showing Ash and Peony an illustrated diagram that almost perfectly matches the creature in front of them. Below the diagram is a caption which reads, Hisuian Zoroa. Ash smiles, officially welcoming Zoroa to the team now that he can use its name, while Brandon mutters that Ash truly is a gift for finding Pokemon that are meant to be extinct, and that this could be the last Hisui and Zoroa in the world, since it is believed that they all died out decades ago. Ash explains that this one was locked away at the bottom of Silesian ruins, so maybe it was caught before they went extinct, a theory which Brandon agrees with, based on the design of its ball. He then urges Ash to train it well, since this breed of Zoro are said to be more willful than their modern day counterpart. But the secret to raising them is... And then the screen goes dead. Ash and Peony look around for any clue as to why this happened, and soon find Zoro viciously attacking the cables and wiring. Having torn up the phone line, it goes next for the panelling on the video phone's console, denting it as it rams its head into the metal. Not wanting Zoroa to hurt itself or do any more damage, Ash fumbles with the clasp and hastily withdraws his newest capture, utterly baffled as to why it suddenly flew into such a rage. The next day, Peony and Peonia are the first to leave, departing not long after dawn, which Peonia is none too thrilled about. Due to Buck having woken them all at sunrise, everyone is present, though by the dirty looks Caitlin is giving Buck, Ash has to wonder if he's going to be present much longer. When the father-daughter duo are gone, Buck tells them it's time they get going too. Caitlin raises an eyebrow incredulously at the suggestion that the four of them would be travelling together, but Buck boasts that he knows the fastest way to Veilstone, so they'd be idiots not to follow him. This seems to get on Caitlin's last nerve, and so she grabs Buck by the sleeve. Ash assumes she's about to send him wherever she sent Conway, but then she surprises him by grabbing his hand and snapping at Barry to grab on as well. Barry groans, knowing what's coming, but complies, and so all four of them find themselves tumbling once more through an infinite void. Moments later, they come out in the middle of a crowded city street, and Caitlin snaps that actually, she knows the fastest way, and if Buck had taken the time to get to know the skill sets of others, rather than just assume he is the best at everything, he would have known that. But instead, he was selfish, short-sighted, and arrogant, so he chose to interrupt her sleep when they could have risen at a reasonable hour and still gotten here long before he would have on his own. 
Buck isn't sure what to say to this. Clearly not used to being spoken to in this manner, but Caitlin doesn't want to hear it anyway, and so instead tells her two friends that she'll show them where the Battle Arcade is. Having never seen Caitlin this angry before, Ash and Barry mutely follow, with Buck trailing at a distance. As Palmer said, the next battle facility is on the former side of the game corner, and right away, they can tell this place will be unlike either of the other they've battled in. Unfortunately for them, when they try to enter, a large closed sign is plastered on the door, with the opening hours below, showing that it only opens for a few hours on Friday nights. Fortunately, it is Friday, but still far too early to gain admission. So as a result, Ash and Barry don't know what to do with themselves until evening, but Buck declares that if he's got to wait, then he might as well use this time to train. Ash says he likes the sound of that, and so agrees to battle Buck as a way to prepare for tonight's battle while Caitlin and Barry watch. Buck, being Buck, declares that he will go first and sends out his clay doll, which for once makes Ash grateful for his brashness, since he was going to send out Meltan, but now he knows his new Zoro would be a much better choice. Clutching the ancient ball, he lobs it, and the white Zorora comes bursting forth, snickering when it sees its opponent. Ash tells it that this will be their first battle together, so this is a chance to get to know each other's style, but the little quadruped rolls its eyes, then looks back to Claydol, as if daring it to attack. Buck is all too happy to oblige, calling for an ancient power and ethereal fossils then form around Claydol before flying at Zorora. Ash tells Zoroa to dodge, and the little fox does so in a way only it can, vanishing into smoke and curling its way behind Claydol, before manifesting once more and slamming its head into Claydol's back, with what the core trio recognised from the tag battle tournament as Shadow Sneak. This does super effective damage on Claydol, and sends it spinning, allowing Ash to call for a snarl, which further buffets the spinning psychic ground type, with more super effective damage. But finally, it does manage to balance itself, and fires off a Psybeam, which strikes Zoroa and sends it tumbling back. The spiteful fox Pokemon yips its pain as it hits the ground, and Buck suggests it give up, but Zoroa refuses, using a move that Ash doesn't know, which seems to chill the air around it as it blasts back with dark energy. This connects, and as well as doing super effective damage, it freezes Claydol solid. Buck demands to know what sort of move that is, but Ash admits that he doesn't even know. This infuriates the redhead, who seems so steamed that it's a wonder the heat radiating off him isn't enough to thaw Claydol. He then orders his partner to break out of the ice, which by sheer force of will, it is able to do, glaring with many eyes at Zoroa. It then hits Zoroa with another Psybeam, which leaves the ancient Pokemon looking dazed, and when Ash calls for another Snarl, it bites down on its own front leg instead. Caitlin calls out that Zoro has been confused, but Ash had already figured that out, as Claydol uses its opponent's vulnerability to get off a quick ancient power, which knocks Zoro around. However, it also snaps the spiteful fox from its confusion, and so Zoro is quite happy to deliver another one of those mystery attacks, when it has all its faculties once more. Claydol is able to counter this with another Psybeam, and so the two attacks clash in mid-air, seemingly perfectly matched, before exploding and sending both Pokemon flying. When the smoke clears, Claydol and Zoroa both lie unconscious at their trainer's feet, and Caitlin calls this match a tie. Buck claims that it was only a tie since Ash had type on his side, and in a fair fight, he would have mopped the floor with him. He then asks Barry if he wants to go around, but Barry declines, which shocks everyone. Buck, however, is not exactly known for his tact, and so asks Barry how he thinks he's going to take on the Battle Arcade if he doesn't train, but here Barry makes an even more alarming claim that he's not so sure if he's going to challenge the arcade with them. He then explains how he and Pringplop have been in a slump since their battle with Caitlyn, and he's seriously worried that something is fractured in their bond. Caitlyn, showing just as little tact as Buck, calls this ridiculous, and snaps at Barry that Shuri told him back in Heart Home to hold his head high and stop whining. Barry protests that she doesn't understand, but Caitlin coldly states that she understands better than him. The issue isn't his and Primplub's bond, it's that they're weak. Barry mutters that this isn't much of a pep talk, but Caitlin coolly says she isn't done. His so-called slump is because he lost to her, Derek, and the daughter of a champion. All three of those trainers were way out of his league, and he never stood a chance from the beginning. But that doesn't matter since she... She then pauses, as if the next words are hard to say, before continuing, since what she really admires about him is that he tries his best anyway and fights every battle with his whole heart. 
This statement leaves Barry with his mouth wide open, causing Caitlin in her usual aloof manner to tell him to close his trap or a bug type will fly in. However, Barry ignores this and instead looks Caitlin in the eye with an expression like he's never seen her clearly before. A smile cresting his face at last, the young blonde thanks his friend and leaps to his feet, declaring at the top of his lungs that he's got some thinking to do, but if they even think about heading to the battle arcade without him, he'll find them to high heaven. Ash beams that he wouldn't dream of it, and so the two rivals clasp hands with mutual grins on their faces. Several hours pass, and it is at last time for Ash, Barry, and Buck's battles. As the group of four arrive once more at the battle arcade, they find that there is a line out the door. All of them are nonplussed by this development, but thankfully a bouncer is present to explain that everyone here is looking to challenge Dahlia tonight. Barry sighs that he didn't think so many people were challenging the Battle Frontier, but the bouncer elaborates that though this is a battle facility, most of the challengers aren't actually here to challenge for a print. Instead, they just want to challenge Dahlia to battle, since she is known for giving out fabulous prizes to those who impress her. A voice then declares that the bouncer flatters her, as a woman who Ash, Barry, and Buck all assume as Dahlia approaches them. Strutting around as though she owns the place, which she truthfully does, this woman flashes the boys a grin before her eyes fall on Caitlin. Her expression then becomes one of utter joy, and she tells the bouncer to let the group pass, since any friend of Katie is a friend of hers. Stiffly, Caitlin replies that her name is Caitlin, not Katie, in a tone that suggests they've had this talk before. But Dahlia pays this no mind, focusing instead on ushering them all inside, all the while gushing about how Caitlin never visits her. She then suggests that maybe Caitlin could act as her player too for tonight, but the younger girl just shakes her head and says she's here to watch, nothing more. This makes Dahlia pout, but only for a second, before her dazzling smile is once more upon her face. She then inquires if these three strapping men are here to challenge her, and when they all nod, she leans in close to Caitlyn, and in a rather loud whisper, asks if they're leet or noobs. Caitlyn dryly replies that she only speaks real words, before pulling away from the group and stepping inside. The other four follow, and good to its name, what they find inside the battle arcade is a giant video game arcade. Several people are already playing on various machines, and Dahlia tells them to get ready since it's time for the games to begin. She then swans away from the boys, reaching the center of the arcade, where a hanging microphone is waiting for her. In a magnifying voice, she calls for silence and welcomes each and every one of them to Arcade Mania, where the rules are simple. For the next 15 minutes, they are all welcome to play as many games as they want, free of charge, and every point they earn will be recorded on the leaderboard. Suddenly, a giant holographic leaderboard with the faces of all the challengers appears above all their heads, and below it is a countdown clock, set for a quarter of an hour. Dahlia then continues that whoever holds the top three spots on the leaderboard when time runs out will be allowed to challenge her to battle. The assembled crowd then begin to applaud, with Caitlin being the notable exception, who rolls her eyes instead. But Dahlia seems used to this sort of behaviour, and so smiles as she rides the microphone up to a large viewing box where the other girl is seated. When she too is in her proper place, Dahlia flashes her audience one last dazzling grin and declares that the games are now open. Down below, pandemonium erupts as everyone attempts to find a starting game now that the clock is ticking. Ash loses sight of his friends almost immediately and is jostled around by the crush of bodies before finally coming out near the wall. In front of him is a vacant backer machine and the instructions on the console tell him this game has a difficulty level of orange, so he and a Pokemon have three chances to get a puck past the goalie and if they can, they will score big points. Knowing just the Pokemon for such a task, Ash calls out Gabite and tells it to use Bulldoze. Gabite yaps its understanding and so shoulder charges the floating disc, sending it rocketing towards the net. Ash can't help but think how easy that was until the robotic goalie jerks to life and zips over to intercept the puck. As a result, it bounces off the robot's face and faintly over the thrum of people and techno music, Ash hears a buzzer that suggests his first attempt was unsuccessful. Thinking hard for a moment, our hero comes up with a new plan of attack, and so tells Gabite to use Bulldoze on the puck once more, but as soon as it does, to fire a dragon breath to the other side of the goal in an attempt to distract the robot. Gabite thinks it understands, and so does as its trainer said, ramming into the puck, then firing a diversionary shot in the opposite direction. 
However, the robot goalie completely ignores this attempted subterfuge, instead going directly to where the puck was meant to land, and so catches it with ease, earning Ash another buzz of failure. But, by watching how the goalie responded, it does provide Ash with a bit of crucial insight to what is ostensibly his opponent. And so this time, for his third and final attempt, he tells Kabite to use Bulldoze and Dragon Breath like before, but this time wait a second and use the second attack on the puck. This plainly baffles Gabite, but it trusts Ash, and so does as he says. Gabite then smacks hard into the puck for the final time, but Ash holds off from giving the second command until he sees the robot move. Then, with a cry from its trainer, Gabite lets out a gale of draconic energy, which clips the puck's side and sends it spiraling in a completely different direction, jackknifing from the bottom left corner of the net to the top right. As Ash suspected, the robot's movements are based on calculating the angle of the shot to predict where it will land, and so it cannot compensate for this sudden change in direction, meaning that as the puck soars over its head, it lands squarely in the net, while ringing bells tell him that he has earned some points. Looking up, Ash sees that his success has rocketed him up to 10th place on the leaderboard, presumably thanks to the difficulty of this game, and so he hugs Gabite before returning it to its ball as another challenger shoves in and demands a shot at the game. Forced back into the crush of bodies, Ash is at least able to stay close to the wall this time, and so when he spots another challenger vacator machine, he dives out and stakes his claim. This game is only classed as difficulty level yellow, so he assumes it will be worth less points than the backer machine, but he's not going to complain, and so presses the start button. At once, a memory matching game with the Sinnoh starters appears on screen, and Ash is tasked with remembering which card is Turtwig, as they are all shuffled around at high speeds. But for someone who grew up watching the blink and you'll miss it pace of Frontier Battles, this is child's play, and so Ash is able to play three rounds with perfect accuracy, but this success has its drawbacks, as a few other challengers have gathered around to watch the boy go, and after his third go, a few of them start complaining that they want to try. Good naturedly, Ash agrees to vacate this time, and so re-enters the throne. When next he surfaces, Ash finds himself standing beside Barry, who has a microphone in his hand, and is standing alongside three other boys, all yelling at a screen. Looking closer, Ash sees that it's a Who's That Pokemon machine, and that the boys are all trying to be the first to identify the silhouettes shown. Naturally, with his murder mouth, Barry is demolishing the competition, and when Ash checks the scoreboard, he is surprised to see that his friend is in first place. However, Barry doesn't get a chance to explain, as a new round silhouette appears on screen, and he frantically screams that it is a Jigglypuff, as seen from above. Bells chime that Barry is right, and he cheers as the others groan, but Ash doesn't have time to congratulate his friend, since he's only in fourth place, and so dives for a free machine when he sees one. This machine is labelled Battle Puzzle, and the instructions say the trainers will be placed into various scenarios and given one turn to achieve victory. The challenge rating is red, but that's fine with Ash, since one win here will be enough to get him into the top three. Booting up the game, he sees that his Pokemon is a Gengar, while his opponent has a Nidorino. He also sees that Nidorino has more health than Gengar, and is likely to go first. Ash has to admit that things look dire, but when he inspects Gengar's moves, a light bulb goes on in his head, and he smiles, thinking he knows the way to claw back a victory in this puzzle. Pressing the buttons to select his attack, Ash watches as Nidorino leaps at Gengar, and awaits his victory. However, at the zenith of Nidorino's leap, the screen fades to white, as all around the battle arcade, machines turn off and music dies down. In her magnified voice, Dahlia declares that time is up, causing Ash to realise that now or never, this is it. If the puzzle machine registered his points as soon as he entered the command, he will be in the top three. But if it was going to register them after showing him the outcome of the battle, then he will have just fallen short. Looking up, Ash searches for his name and finds it. In the top three. As Ash sighs with relief, Dahlia calls for the three lucky winners to join her so they can get this boss battle started. And to his surprise, Ash feels the tile he is standing on lift up and carry him towards Dahlia. Looking around, he sees that Barry and Buck's tiles are doing likewise, while the rest of the floor is rearranging itself to take on the appearance of a battlefield. When Ash, Barry and Buck are deposited on the other side of the field from Dahlia, she congratulates them for being such top tier gamers and informs them that their reward is a battle against her for a prize of their choosing, for asking if they know what they want. 
In unison, the friends reply that they want a challenge for her frontier print. This makes Dahlia's eyes light up, and she says it's been a long time since she's had three frontier challenges at once, which means she's finally allowed to up the difficulty setting to max and really cut loose. The boys all nod eagerly, before Barry cuts in to ask who's going to be battling first. This makes Dahlia tut that it wouldn't be fair if they had to face her alone, so instead this will be a raid battle, all of them at once against her one and only, her faithful partner, her Togekiss. She then reveals the Jubilee Pokemon, and after it does a lap around the ring, Dahlia pets it fondly and says it's time to show these three the power of their strats. The challengers then pull out their Pokeballs and send in their Pokemon, Claydol for Buck, Prinplup for Barry, and Meltan for Ash. Dahlia squeeze when she sees Meltan, but Ash is all business, taking the lead and calling for a Thunder Wave. However, as the electrical currents shoot at Togekiss, it does a barrel roll and dive bombs Prinplup. Prinplup looks uncertainly at Barry after their recent battles, but the blonde trainer is all smiles and he decisively calls for a Metal Claw. Prinplup nods and crosses its flippers in front of it, meeting Togekiss and holding it in place for a moment. However, the flying type soon breaks through, sending Prinplop rolling backwards, but Barry doesn't let his grin drop, encouraging Prinplop that it's okay to be knocked down, since they're not a great team because they never fall, they're a great team because they never stay down long. Prinplop's eyes go wide at this, and some of the weight it seems to have been carrying since Hartholm falls away as it smiles back at its trainer. Then, as if filled with new life, Prinplop rises to its feet and begins to glow. However, Dali is not going to allow such a drastic power shift so early in the game, and so orders Togekiss to stop that evolution with an air slash. Togekiss then fires off a blade of pressurized air, which soars towards Prinplop, but Ash orders Meltan to intercept it, knowing the flying type attack will do minimal damage to it. Meltan obeys, and so after taking the hit, goes skidding along the ground. Buck demands to know what Ash is thinking, since that stunt could have cost him his chance at the print, but Ash sternly replies that this battle is a team effort, so they all need to be willing to make sacrifices for the good of the team, and it worries him that Buck doesn't understand this. Buck replies that he doesn't have to, since he's got this covered all on his own, calling for Claydol to rush in and obliterate Togekiss with a hyper beam. Claydol glides forward and fires off an undeniably powerful blast, while Dahlia muses whether Buck's lone wolf routine means that he's the real deal, or just trying to cover up that he's the weakest link. Either way, the best way to find out is to test it, and so she calls for a counter hyper beam. Despite Claydol's hyper beam being inches away from its face, Togekiss is able to split the attack cleanly in half with its own hyper beam, which tears through Claydol's with ease before consuming the ground psychic type in a fierce explosion. Ash and Barry both call out Buck's name in shock and horror, but when the smoke clears, Claydol is still hanging on, but only by a narrow margin. They also see that it is inert, needing to recharge, but looking up, they see Togekiss is in the same position, meaning that whether he meant to or not, Buck just bought them the opportunity they needed. As Barry's newly evolved Empoleon stops glowing, its trainer calls for an Aqua Jet, and at once it is engulfed in water. Meltan then grabs onto its back, and the pair go blasting up into the air, where they strike Togekiss hard. Both Ash and Barry then call for follow-up attacks, with Empoleon using Metal Claw and Meltan using Thundershock. Both deal super effective damage, but this bulky flyer is still a long way from going down, and so with its prey at such close range, fires off a super effective Aura Sphere, which drops both Empoleon and Meltan. Dahlia then turns her attention back to Buck, sighing that she's lost her shot at a flawless victory, but she can still finish him before calling for another Air Slash. Knowing that Meltan is in no state to take another one for the team, and too proud to ask even if it could, Buck instead tells Claydol to dodge. However, even though Claydol manages to avoid the main attack, the shockwave it leaves behind is still enough to buffer the Claydol Pokemon and send it spinning. Dahlia then calls for another, saying she loves a chain combo. As bid, Togekiss fires off another Air Slash, and Buck uses the only trick he has left, calling for a Hyper Beam to push it back. Even with all of Hyper Beam's power, all Claydol can do is slow the Air Slash, and Dahlia complains that stalling tactics are boring and to stop delaying the inevitable. However, Ash and Barry counter that maybe it would be inevitable if he were alone, but Buck has a team. Meltan and Empoleon then rise to their feet and add Bubble Beam and Thundershock to Hyper Beam. 
Only together are they able to push the attack back, and when the combined attacks hit Togekiss, it actually howls in pain. The three boys then look at each other, finally on the same wavelength, with Ash taking the leadership role and telling Buck that Claydol should hang back since it's taken the worst of the damage and provide long range support, while Empoleon and Meltan get in close. The other two boys nod, and so Meltan climbs onto Empoleon's back as it flies up with another Aqua Jet, while Claydol begins its barrage of ancient powers to cover them. This splitting of Togekiss's focus works in the boy's favour, as the flying type is forced to give more priority to avoiding Claydol's attacks than stopping Empoleon's. As a result, Aqua Jet hits, and so Barry calls for a Metal Claw, but Dahlia asks if they really want to do this again, calling for another Aura Sphere, which she believes will put both Pokemon out of commission. However, Ash anticipated this, and so makes the difficult call, telling Meltan to use Headbutt on the Aura Sphere, detonating it prematurely, and allowing Empoleon to land its super effective attack, but at the cost that Meltan hits the ground hard, and doesn't get up. As Empoleon lands, Dahlia commends Ash for being a team player, but says that it looks like it's game over for him. However, Caitlin, who is still watching from the viewing box, cries that that isn't true, since Meltan isn't unconscious, it's napping. All four combatants turn to look at the little steel type, and like Caitlin said, it is snoring softly, fast asleep. Barry cries that Meltan sure could have picked a better time, but Ash disagrees, saying Meltan must have learned the move Rest, and used it to recover from the two Aura Spheres. This perks the blonde up, and he whoops that if Meltan gets back to full health, that could be just what they need to turn things around, and so vows that Empoleon and Claydol will protect it while it recovers. Buck nods, and so calls for another ancient power, while Barry has Empoleon use Bubble Beam. Now having one target instead of two, Togekiss is easily able to dodge both attacks, and flies low, skimming over the battlefield as it zeroes in on the sleeping Meltan. Barry suggests a change of tack, but Buck says there's no time, ordering Empoleon to grab Meltan and run while Claydol charges in at Togekiss. Barry furiously questions whether Bucks learned anything, since they need to talk about this and make a plan together if they're going to win. But Buck just grimaces that he never was all that good at playing with others, and when Claydol rams into Togekiss, he calls for an explosion. The whole battle arcade shakes as Claydol explodes, and black smoke obscures everything. Ash and Barry stare at Buck in stunned silence, neither of them ever imagining that he would give up his shot at a print for either of them. Ash opens his mouth to speak, but Buck is faster, saying that this battle is a team effort, and so he made a sacrifice for the good of the team, simple as that. Unfortunately, this moment is interrupted when Togekiss emerges from the smoke, severely injured, but still able to fight. Dahlia's face appears next, and she tells Buck that what he did was noble, but alas, he's out of lives, so it's time to say goodbye. Buck stoically accepts this, looking at his two teammates and ordering them to win so his sacrifice won't be in vain. Ash and Barry swear that they will, and so Buck smiles as he returns Claydol to its ball and allows the tile he's standing on to carry him away. Now down to a 2v1, Barry has Empoleon take up a vigil over the sleeping Meltan and tells it to be ready for Togekiss's next attack. Dahlia smiles that it's a brave but futile effort ordering Togekiss to use Sky Attack to finish this. Unflinchingly, Barry says to meet it with an Aqua Jet, and so the two Pokemon both take off, clashing in mid-air with a sound like a sonic boom. This at last is enough to wake Meltan, and the Hexnut Pokemon looks refreshed as it rises up and surveys the battle. Urgently, Ash tells it to help Empoleon with a Thundershock, and so the small Steel-type lets off a bolt of electricity, which makes Togekiss falter in mid-air, but even still it endures. Dahlia then declares that since Meltan is fully healed, that makes Empoleon the weakest link, and so orders Togekiss to finish it off with another Aura Sphere. Togekiss obeys and lobs the Orb of Blue Aura at its foe, who is too close to dodge. But thankfully, Ash's quick thinking has Meltan meet it with another Thundershock. Just as with Hyper Beam against Air Slash, Thundershock alone lacks the power to knock back Aura Sphere, and so Barry offers to have Empoleon help but Ash tells him that Meltan can handle this, and to focus on finishing off Togekiss. Barry nods, and so Empoleon takes off with another Aqua Jet. However, Togekiss has gotten used to this trick by now, and so is able to dodge the aerial water attack with ease, forcing Empoleon to chase after it, but never get close enough to hit. Meanwhile, Aura Sphere continues inching closer towards Meltan, and even after its nap, the Steel-type is tiring under the strain of trying to hold the attack back. 
Ash can think of only one way to salvage this, and so he looks at Meltan, and with pleading in his voice, implores it to use Thunderbolt. Meltan squeaks that it can't, but Ash presses on, telling his starter that he believes in it, reminding it how far they've come, and repeating the words that they read in the Slacian ruins, saying that what was born when their two lives met is a partnership that can overcome any obstacle so long as they do it together. Dedication and determination well up inside Meltan, and with a defiant cry to the heavens, it pushes its power further than it ever thought possible before. Every fibre of its being seems to become electric for a moment, and with a yellow flash, the force of Thundershock grows exponentially, shattering Aurosphere, and arcing up to strike right into Togekiss. Togekiss is helpless and paralysed in the face of such sheer force, and this is at last what Empoleon needs to catch up and soar over the top of Togekiss. With a mutual cry of, DO IT! From both Ash and Barry, Meltan continues to put its heart and soul into holding Togekiss in place with its newly learned Thunderbolt, while Empoleon braves the electrical storm to slam a full force metal claw down onto Togekiss's head. This at last is enough to drive the Jubilee Pokemon into the ground, with a dust cloud almost as large as the smoke cloud caused by Claydol's explosion. When the dust settles, Togekiss is unable to battle, and a massive cry fills the battle arcade. Dahlia looks like she might cry, but only very briefly, before she is smiling once more as she swans over to congratulate the two victors. They both thank her for such an intense battle, and she tells them it was her pleasure before handing them each an arcade print. She then calls out to Buck, saying that after some thought, she's willing to bend the rules a little and give him a print as well for his valiant sacrifice. However, to her surprise, he refuses, saying that he wants to be as strong as his big bro, and he can't do that by taking handouts, so he'll stick around and earn his print fair and square next week. Dahlia smiles that she looks forward to that battle then, before turning her attention back to Ash and Barry, and wishing them luck on the rest of their Battle Frontier challenge, as she gestures for the crowd of onlookers to clear a path so they can leave. However, Barry stops her here, saying that now they've gotten three prints, isn't she meant to tell them the location of the fourth battle facility? This causes genuine shock to cross Dahlia's face, and she exclaims that she thought Caitlin would have told them where it was already. Both Ash and Barry shake their heads, asking why she'd think that, to which Dahlia shrugs, because she's the fourth frontier brain.